Some of the most hallowed numbers are 5150 in rock and roll. We're going to talk to somebody who knows exactly what they mean. You know where you're at, Pensado's Place. Hey, everybody. Glad you came back. Uh, Herb and I have had an eventful week. <laughs> I think we logged more, more air miles than anybody. <laughs> Uh, what are you going to do with all your frequent flyer miles? Here? I don't know, man. I was going to see if we could get your flight to Santa Monica and just <laughs> hang out. <laughs> well, man, uh, I'm so happy. I, uh, our guest today is George Sayer. I met George uh, a couple of years ago and was just fascinated by his expertise, his experiences, and uh, uh, he's worked with some of the biggest names in music. He was. Uh, very, very, very responsible for Eddie Van Halen and, and all things Van Halen for a number of years. And so we're going to pick his brain about some of that. He worked with Will Smith in and, and, and a number of capacities. We'll get into that. Shout out to John Marie. He's watching. Um, our, our buddy Dylan is, um, is in the batter's box. So we're going to we got, we got to think of something funny to mess Dylan up. I owe Dylan big time for the... Uh, what mic did you use on the... Uh... And the cool part is if we come up with nothing, Dylan will come up with something <laughs> and throw it yeah. back at us. Yeah, um, Dylan's my favorite. Let's do a little bit of homework really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously want to make a shout out to our, our strategic partners, Vintage King. Hey, Vintage King, what's happening? We'll have folks in the, in the chat room as we usually do. Um, it's, in fact, it's going to be our buddy Alex that's going to be in the chat room. Um, our guys will throw up our page. You know how to get in contact with us, which is real critical. So Facebook, as usual, where we talk to you. Also, um, Twitter and um, our YouTube page, where you'll go see us. You stream in the chat room. We see it's full of people. So um, we're going to be getting to that later in the corner office. A couple quick things. I want to talk to you a quick second about your own power. Um, our eminent producer, Will, uh, we met over the weekend, and one of the things he he showed us um, in the internet world as you guys probably know we get a chance to utilize really specific analytics so Facebook and Google give us all kinds of information about you and how you're watching um, web's a big place and thanks to your power you put Pensado's place on their landing page of their 30 top shows in a category called web originals um, I gotta tell you we were blown away we thank you uh, it speaks to your power. It speaks to the interactivity of what you're doing. So as you do that and you put in comments, make sure you like us and so on and so forth. Um, those kinds of things have a lot of effect on this show continuing. So um, never underestimate, underestimate your power. Know that we're listening and watching, and obviously other people are too. So we give you real big shout outs for that. Yeah, um, and just to give you another example, I got an email from, um, I think his name is Kevin. It's either Masha or Massa from Kenya of all places and he just was effusive about the show but one of the powers of the show and the interactivity and in creating this community of our families here is they literally take our show bring in a group of students gather their engineering buddies put them through whatever we're talking about whatever you're talking about then teach them about the engineering and then find them work to go out and further their craft and you know Obviously, we're trying to do something kind of cool here. It's humbling. But it's stuff like that that just speaks to the power of both the medium and, and your personal power. So shout outs. And, and we have various stories. We had a conference call with the chairman of USC Music who said, uh, the USC audio program, who beyond wanting you to come speak or, or deal with the Pro Tools um, forum, also said, you know, I'm going to require my students to watch the show next mm -hmm next year. So we're getting a lot of that. I don't want to belabor the point. We, we just think that we're, we're grateful and we're humbled and it um, says a lot about you, not just about us. It says a lot about you. So tune in, tell a friend, keep it going. Enough of that stuff. Back to you so we can get to the meat of the show. Man, I'm excited about uh, uh, ITL this week as a continuation of last week. Uh, trying to catch up on a lot of the questions that you were asking and uh, once again, it's not definitive answers on everything. We're just trying to get you uh, pointed in the right direction to, to, to figure out some of this stuff for yourself. Um, am I forgetting anything, Herb, or should we go straight to ITL? Let's go to ITL and we'll come back and get to it. Okay. All right, guys, check this out. We're ready, Will. All right, guys, I'm going to show you, just kind of take you through. I just started this song a few days ago, and, and I'm just coming back to it, but... Um, 
I want to take you through a little bit of, of um, our thought process. A lot of you guys ask, what do you start, what level do you start, where do you start? I always start with just my NS10s and about this level, maybe a hair louder, and then I just mix to that. And it seems to work out where a few million people want to go buy it. I don't look at levels. I don't look at meters. I don't look at anything. I just... It, I just, it just sounds right, and I, I guess I've done it so much, it sounds right. So anyway, I, when I got this snare, I thought, oh, that's a good sound of snare. I like the top end of that. And then this was another snare they gave me. I thought, oh, that's really cool. And I thought, you know what? Maybe, maybe if we add a little bit of a clap sound to it, they might like it. They might hate it. So if, if, when, if, when you hear the record of this, it in that means they didn't like it. I thought it gave it a vibe. And then I tried EQing. Um, I tried EQing those three. I'm summing those into here. I tried. I tried EQing individually, and I, I I didn't like it. So I decided to run it through a sub, and uh, that didn't work. So um, uh, here's the sub. Let's nuke that. Okay. Now, I do have a little bit of EQ on it with, with the P6. Okay, pretty subtle. Okay, now, I took this, this snare, the one that had a little bit of the top end, and I ran it parallel into the, into, um, this is parallel compression that's coming in here. Uh, the, the DVX 160 on the UAD just seems to have the perfect attack, and then transient designer. So this is what it added. Cool, huh? Okay, let me take those off. That's what it added. With it, I might have a little too much. Let's back it off. Yeah, I like that. So what? When I got this track, um, I, I I went through everything pretty quick, and I liked um, I liked the acoustic guitars a lot. So I worked on those first. So the acoustic guitars. Pretty well recorded. I'm sending those. We, we talked about the dual 910. Um, oh, that was during the clear out the middle days. Only difference is I'm putting a little reverb on it now. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. And then there's another another component to the acoustics I like. To me, that's the song. Remember how Jack Joseph talked about the acoustic? Okay. And then after I got that, I, I, I put in my top end stuff. Started working on this. My tambourine. Remember how Jack said, "Just get, just get a groove," you know? Or was that Jack or somebody was talking? One of our guys was the groove. That was Jack, right? Well, I mean. That's, I can't stop moving, and I haven't even added the drums yet. Now, at that point in time, I went back and I, I added the kick. Bass.
Now they had now they had a guitar. I really love this guitar. Now this guitar had had um, it was all combined into one track. And I took uh, I took that and put it on a track by itself. And then I left the little the little uh, percussive stuff in between on this track. But this was all this track down here was incorporated in this track. And you can see where I just I just split them off to have a little more control, but um, I'm gonna start a little earlier so that you can get the verse vibe. the idea. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go back and show you all that again, but you kind of get the idea of how, how you put the song together. Uh, I, I, um, on the guitars, um, this is what I had on, all on one track. Okay, but let me show you. Um, When I had the guitars at the volume I wanted, see how much lower that is. So what what I needed to turn the the waka 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 I needed to turn that down. So the only way I could do it was like this. So now it's So, a lot of little lessons there, just, you know, um, you, you, several of you have been asking me how I start. On this song, I started, I listened to everything really quick, and then I listened to the rough mix. And in the rough mix, I, I, I just fell in love with the acoustics, so I thought I'd, I'd build a track around, uh, can't see without my damn glasses. I thought I'd build the track around the acoustics, so I got the acoustics sounding the way I liked. They were already compressed pretty good, so I didn't feel a need to compress them, but... You, you, you could compress them if, if you wanted to. So anyway, that's kind of that's kind of the thought process behind a song that hopefully you'll be hearing real soon. And um, showed you a couple of new things, the MPX, the, some of the UAD stuff. Um, by the way, the PIE and the Helios from Waves, I just got that very, very impressive. A lot of you guys have been asking me about 808s. Uh, try the PIE on an 808. Um, I I, I, uh, I really, 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 really like the way it sounds. If you don't believe me, uh, hit Drew up. I, I did, did an A-B for Drew. Pretty impressive. Okay, guys, so that's our ITL for today. We've got, like I keep telling you, we've got some, some pretty important ones coming up. Not that this one wasn't. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, I, I can't answer all of the questions in one ITL, but I felt like uh, if I could just take a song I just started, kind of take you through the process of how I put it together, let you hear it now. There, as you can tell, there's a lot more tracks here. There's a, there's a lot more different guitar parts and everything, but, but we've got the essence of it. We've got a good JJP kind of groove thing going with just the acoustics and, and, um, and then when we added the drums and then, and then experimenting with our side chain to kind of let the kick stand out a little more in the hooks. Uh, keeping everything kind of working together, and uh, anyway, back to you, Dave. Hey, everybody, before we get to this great guest segment that we got, got we got to remind you, we're going to give you a little incentive in the corner office. Our CJ, Drew, has now arrived after dealing with the 405 and its craziness. There he is. So uh, he's in the corner office checking out your questions, and our Vintage King strategic partners, who we like so much, they provide a little incentive for you. So we're going to pick the best questions. Dave, you want to show them what they get? Look at there. Oh. you got to get your VK shirt. Even Drew has one, which means there's more than one. 
So we're going to get, <laughs> <we're, laughs> get three or four of those out to you. So get your questions in during this guest segment. And then between our team and everybody else, we're going to pick them. And uh, we'll get these sent out to you. So let's get to the good stuff. Who we got, Dave? Man, my buddy George I spoke about a little earlier. Uh, can't wait to pick his brain. He um, he's, uh, was uh, the, 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 the chief tech engineer for uh, 5150. He essentially uh, was responsible for all things Eddie. Then he also worked with Will Smith, built Will Smith's home studio. And um, uh, I think we actually met at the Boom Boom Room. We did. Yeah, for the first time, Will yeah. Smith's studio. So George, man, thanks for coming up. Thank you for I know you for had thinking some, to have uh, me. I really appreciate it. I know you had some issues recently. And uh, uh, thank you. You know, we, our sympathies for that. But thank you so much appreciate for making it. the time to be here. Thank you so much. I, I in, want to interrupt you just one second sure. to say that congratulations, a formal congratulations on your beautiful setup here. It's great. What, oh. a, what a great vibe. Oh, thanks. Do you like the Charlie Rose of rock and roll? Oh, cool. <laughs> That's weird. Because when, we when, we when we were thinking about how to do the show, Herb was, was adamant that it needed to be uh, good TV first yeah. and needed to have a, a Charlie, Charlie Rose element. So that's a compliment to Herb. That's interesting. So yeah, you're picking up right away. It's a great vibe. I, I really appreciate oh, you. Cool. Yeah. Well, who's the most like Charlie Rose, me or Herb? Well, <laughs> I think it's a combination. <laughs> Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose. There you go. <laughs> I got, I got a little yeah. bit of an Oprah vibe, don't you? Yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys got, a, you got a great thing. Oh, going by the way, it. you guys that keep uh, making the Oprah references, keep them coming. I said some funny <laughs> stuff in her. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Ms. Winfrey, but uh, I'll take them as compliments. Uh -huh. So, man, let's jump right into it. Uh, word on the street is that you you built Eddie Eddie Van Halen's guitar pedal. Yeah, I did. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, interesting thing, the way it happened was that uh, I had come to work at the studio uh, in uh, in 98, and that was on the basis of kind of taking over and getting the studio uh, uh, kind of uh, fixed up a little bit. And uh, in the course of that, they had already been working on the record Van Halen 3 and were getting ready to do a tour. Mm -hmm. and. I had heard Ed talking about how he had, in the past, difficulties in, on tours with different kinds of switching systems and things like that. And what you got to understand about Ed is that he's such a purist. I mean, what you really get from Ed's playing is you get first from his heart, then from his head, and right out of his hands. So he wants the pure essence of his sound. And he doesn't like a lot of electronics. It's simple is best for him. And when we were talking about it, I, I said, I said, hey, it seems like to me, if you wanted to get your the, the real true essence of like even the early days, you know, pick out the pedals that you used to like, you know, and, and he already, obviously, that's, <laughs> he already used them. And uh, we'll build you loops, front end loops, you know, before the amp that will select, you can on your pedal board select no MIDI, he didn't like MIDI at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's go for um, individual loops to front end your amplifier so that you get the purest guitar tone, guitar right in to one or the other or several in a bank. Mm -hmm. And that's, how, that's basically what that, was, what that was all about. And I, I had hand picked, I had hand selected some very, very nice um, high tech uh, switching relays to do the job. Gold, plated contacts, and uh, uh, gas uh, uh, sealed. So that these are the kinds of things. That they'll, they'll send them up on the space shuttle, you know, and they'll live yeah. forever, you know, that kind of thing. Because I knew stuff that's going to have to go around the world with it, it's going to have to live. And I actually built two separate rigs for him. So he always had a backup, always had a spare. And that really was the heart of his, of his pedal board. Um, so he basically, that with an MXR Phase 90, his favorite, wow. MXR Flanger. Um, the, the, uh, the gray plug-in one or the bad yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, no, the, 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 the gray plug-in one. I mean, real basic. Ed is so hands-on and so, like I said, such a purist that he loves just the, the he loves to know that as, as close as he can get to plugging his guitar into the amp, mm -hmm. straight in, that's 
That's the what Ed sound. What was he using at the time? At the at the time, he was using his um, the uh, the PV series of uh, 5150 Mark II's, um, which I actually had uh, contributed something to. I had uh, designed a little bias circuit for the output section oh, wow. um, because it needed it needed to be tubes. Vacuum tubes at the time were getting very very difficult to get in any kind of um, symmetrical order, if you will, for uh, you know le electrically speaking. And so that enabled to really fine tune the amp for the tubes and stuff. Did you so use like an FET type circuit or? Uh, no, no, that was just a strict bias circuit for the uh, just uh, uh, very simple um, resistance circuit. Oh, I see. Yeah, but uh, let's, if it's okay with you, let's come back to some of the technical yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One absolutely. of the things that that uh, I'm so fascinated about, and uh, I think I drive our audience crazy, Herb. <laughs> But I, I, I love the creative process, and, and when I listen, being a guitar player, um, I listen to Eddie, and there's just something special about that cat. There's, uh, I, I would say there hasn't been five people put on this earth that can do what, what, he, what he does emotionally. Now, the technical part, he's a classically trained pianist. He's, you know, his parents were musicians. I mean, that's a given. But just because you can type a hundred words a minute doesn't mean you're going to write a great novel. You got it. But Eddie, when I first heard uh, "You Really Got Me," I mean, it 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 it's partly responsible why I'm an engineer because I figured there's just no more point in me playing guitar. That 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 <laughs> world's covered. <laughs> I'm just going to go be an engineer now. And, uh, yeah, yeah, put, just put it down. I know when Close I'm beating. Case, I know when over. I'm with. <laughs> Most guitar players, in fact, in that, back in that day, all guitar players were egotistical gunslinger maniacs. And if there was somebody better, faster than you, it just ruined your week. Yeah. But Eddie ruined my life mm. in the guitar a world. Of, a lot of people's lives. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and I say that respectfully. Oh, I don't mean that in, neg in a negative way. But it, it, I, I, I'm exaggerating. But in a little small way, it was the impetus for me to think about another area of music and and I lucked into this engineering thing but describe to me a typical day when when Eddie's recording in terms of his creative process and uh, the, does you you saw a few songs being created from scratch does he go in and jam them together does he come in he it's 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 very interesting I have to say I, I love Ed tremendously, and I always have, even obviously before I met him. You're a guitar player yourself. Yeah, oh, sure. I've been playing since I was about eight. I should be a lot better, probably, but <laughs> <laughs> for all that time. But uh, nowhere near Ed. But it's it's. Uh, but the thing is, I was able to take that understanding with me, along with the technical, into 5150. And the the thing that I that I learned most, I think, at 5150 was that uh, coming to work there on, on any given day, um, you bring your skills, you bring your abilities, you bring your knowledge, you bring your tools. You check your ego at the door, and there, you're there for it. And basically what happens is... He, Repeat that, George. I want you guys to hear this because uh, I, I would say this should be a plaque on the wall of every bedroom of every engineer out there. <laughs> Repeat that again, George. That was great. Uh, I hope I can remember what I said. But basically, it's, it's, I think the attitude, the approach, if you will, to going to work with an artist. If you're going to work closely with an artist of that caliber, I think it's important to remember that you, you learn whatever you can. You bring your knowledge with you. You bring your skills with you your tools, whatever, whatever hardware, whatever software, whatever you need, but on the, at the door, you check, you check your ego. And, uh, and that's a, I think it's a very important thing, because it's a very humbling experience yeah. to work with somebody like that. Yeah, especially when you respect them. Though. Last Absolutely. night at dinner, Herb said something almost identical in terms of uh, his approach to managing an artist. It was kind of a similar approach that you have to management. I, I wonder if that's almost a universally applied concept to things bigger than music itself, Herb. Well, I, because I want to hear what, what you're going to say, I, I just think that you have to respect somebody who's great, their space, oh, yeah. and then try to enhance their space in a way, because then what ends up happening, and, and confirm or, or disprove what I'm saying, is that then you get a certain kind of really hallowed trust back yeah. that becomes something that, that 
that is, has a real responsibility to it, it correct? Re absolutely, you're and, absolutely correct. And you work one of the greatest. So, so philosophically, well, how do you I, work? I, I, just, uh, I appreciate the compliment, but I have to say that, I mean, I was a student there as much as I was, you know, working, bringing whatever I could to the table. But I'll tell you, and keep, I'm keeping in mind that this is an answer to your question about what it's like for the creative process on Ed's part. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you have to try, the reason why I, I, I try to describe that um, that way is, is to, you have to go in with what you have, but you can't get in the way of what he's doing. And that's, a, you walk that fine line. And I realize, you know, let's face it, I mean, we're all gearheads. We're all gear crazy. We love, you know, everything. And I know that a lot of your, a lot of the people watching are really into know, learning more about what, what that is and what that means to use those things in proper settings and things like that. It's very, very important. You have to have good gear. You have to ha know how to use it well. But before any of that is, is, is taken into account, I think you have to remember that, that uh, some, working with someone like Ed as an artist closely, uh, you're, you're there for him. You have to allow him to, to be himself and not get in the way of that process. Ed is all about the process because that's how he gets to the end. Okay, he, his, 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 his final product is, it, it begins in, uh, with him noodling around in the living room on, with some amazing idea that just comes to him. You know, he's, I, I respect him. I think he's one of the few geniuses that I've met um, uh, on this planet. And I have to say that his inspiration is what carries him. His technical ability is certainly there. There's no question about it. I mean, you know, it's obvious to anyone. Um, but it's his inspiration. It's what speaks to his heart that comes out of his hand. Um, you can hand this guy a $69 Strat copy. You can hand him a, a $19,000 Les Paul. When he plugs into an amp, it's still Ed. <laughs> it's the bottom line is it's always going to be Ed. I believe it. I believe that. When, 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 when you were around him, when he actually created a song, did he start with with one of those living room licks and then expand on it and then bring in uh alex and bring in uh uh bass players uh, uh, me. yeah michael anthony michael he's anthony he's a car nut like me so I, I can't believe i missed michael uh how did, how did that process work did, did other people bring in the nucleus for the song or was eddie always the nucleus for starting the, the mostly the ed is the nucleus for for starting it. i mean uh alex by the way who's a tremendous musician i have to say i mean i should i should i'd be remiss if i didn't say that alex is also i find uh, I, I found to be a true genius he is a powerhouse at the drums he is he is a a uh, an incredibly meticulous um uh, performer mm -hmm. and musician and he is a disciplined you can't believe this guy can accomplish. You don't often hear the word discipline in the same sentence with Van Halen. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it's pretty rare, but you... But in the studio, they were disciplined. Yeah, well, I mean, not, I'm not going to say they wouldn't get crazy, because they get crazy, but I'm talking about when he actually gets down to... I mean, the, the show performance is when, you know, you have to remember, when you go to a concert and you're seeing Van Halen, you're seeing all the bugs worked out of every song, everything is perfect, everything is to the nines, okay? Uh, but they've taken all the time to, to do all their homework and, and make all that right so that you have a great show. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's all about. They're, they're amazing. Can I share they, with you yeah, yeah, please. two seconds of that? Please. Uh, that, that speaks to your point. Yeah. Completely anecdotal and completely accidental. But where my office is happens to be Alex comes up because one of his representatives uh, is in yeah, the office. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's his business manager's account or something. And <clears throat> I was in the hallway, he didn't know who I am, and i you know, not going to go up and go, but he was talking to somebody on the staff yeah. about preparing for rehearsal. Is that right? And exactly what you're talking about was exactly what was going on. He was going through point by point, yeah. detail by detail, wow. making sure it was correct. And, and just as somebody who does what I do, I just sort of appreciated that level of thoroughness after so much time of doing it. Some yeah. people just say, you know, staff will take care, I'll show up. He was no, no, way no. in it. No, absolutely, you're absolutely correct. And they're so hands-on. I mean, you have to remember that, that these brothers had taken themselves from, from pre-teens into this business. Well, that they nobody started did. out, when they started out, <laughs> Alex was the guitar player and Eddie was the drummer. <laughs> exactly right. Isn't that weird? And a lot of people don't even know that, but, no. the, the funny, but you're absolutely right. But they, nobody did it for them. You know, they, they really did this for themselves. And, and I, I, it was such an honor to even, 
to even be there for the time that I was. I have to, I have to say that uh, that's why I said it's a very humbling experience, and you really learn what it means to bring what you can uh, without interfering with what is going on there. And you just you try to help. You, you, you may offer suggestions. You may have to. Uh, it is good to be very, uh, uh, be, be very sure of what you are and what you can be. But you have to always, you know, be recessive. You have to always take the back seat in a way, and make yeah. sure you let, allow the artist to flourish. And, and to, tr to be to be truthful, I don't know if I was always able to do it the best, but I know that I can tell you that I tried. Well, you must have a lot of good a lot of good music came out of that that uh, time period. You, 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 when you and I were speaking on the phone the other day, you, I said, you know, what was uh, what was Eddie's miking set up? And you said there wasn't one. <laughs> But uh, if you're comfortable asking a couple of specific questions, if, 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 if it's not applicable, just let me know. Did he tend to use one mic in front of the ca one cabinet, or did he, did, he, did he try to have two cabinets and record a, a stereo, or did he put a, tend to put a stereo mic in front of one cabinet? I can't, I can't help you with this. It's, 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 I, like I said, I mean, no, no two days were alike at 5150. But here's the thing. Ed will always cater to the song. He never goes by rote. Mm -hmm. He never says, "This is what I do." I'm I'm EVH, and this is what I do, mm -hmm. all the time. It's because he is so flexible and so inventive and so creative about everything that he is who he is. Mm -hmm. um, to to be specific, um, one of the things that that I thought I helped with there was I found a pair of um, the old. Uh, uh, you remember the old RCA 44, of course. Yeah, the 77. The, no, the 44. The the a AEA made the replicas. Oh, okay. You know Wes Dooley. Uh, yeah, anyway. Wes is my friend. Yeah. Wes Dooley. Wes Dooley, what Wes, a great guy. Hope you're watching. Well, I, f I, f I found a, a, a pair of those for him, uh, and that became a really you know because just that long fat ribbon yeah. in that mic, and what a great in, in, incredible detail and tone that you get from that and he he seemed to really take to that that they blow out kind of easily not wes's mics but the original the mics original blow out. yeah but wes has built them so that they and yeah, but yeah. what we did was we wes's are tanks ed likes to have one kind of close and then one a little further back in, in the room and if you have to you know you, you flip the phase if, if need be going. did he pan those left and right uh, sometimes for a stereo thing yeah uh, there was sometimes when he used stereo cabinets there were sometimes when he used it was it was all about this just getting that one direct sound off that cabinet mm -hmm. Ed can make anything sound good an SM57 a 421 a C12 and you know it depends really on he played to what he heard exactly did you he know, use Celestians you, or do you remember yes yeah, Celestians mostly the, the greenbacks or the yellows oh green Mostly greenbacks, oh. and there were other. Uh, I remember I had even given. We him just this. lost Drew. He don't know what a greenback or <laughs> yellow is. Um, the I had actually given him a a, a, a selection thirty watt blackback that he loved. It was just a single and a little twelve. Oh, out of the Marshall 12. Major cabinet. No, it was actually not oh, good for you. You know, it was just really just a, a little one twelve that I had, and he loved it, and I just I, I let him uh, go with that for uh, a couple of times. But one of the things that um, I was. Um, I had a thought, and I was trying to follow it about about It'll the, back the miking system. Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was just, I, I guess, I guess, really, the whole the whole idea is that, uh, um, you know, Ed Ed is is a, is a creative um, entity, and and so he will do whatever it takes for that. Would song. he physically gra grab a mic and move it himself? Oh yeah. While the oh, this is wrong? what I was going to say. Exactly. Thank you for for bringing it back up. Ed likes to go and listen to the sound while he's playing at different points in the room. And wherever his ear hears what he likes, that's where it put the mic. Wow. Very that's interesting. Indeed. The guy is just, you know, I mean, I, I can't say enough about him. I mean, I, he, in addition to, to being a great, a great artist and a talent to work with, he also, I should say this, is that he helped me out at a very difficult time in my life. Wow. And I, can, I cannot say enough about someone like that, who, who, who he has helped so many people that nobody ever knows about. I mean, children, I mean, you have no idea what he's done for different groups. He's really, he doesn't publicize it. It's never been, I mean, he's, he's, he's one very, very special man. In terms of, um, were, you, were you privy to watch uh, any of Michael Anthony's? Uh, Yes. Chain, uh, in terms of miking the bass, how did they how did they do that? Uh, actually, it was because he typically used the um, you know the SVT with uh, you know the A10 system, mm -hmm. and basically it was kind of like one at the top and one at the bottom, 
a lot of times, and usually just 57s. You know, oh, yeah. 57s is just you know, it's it's, yeah. it's it's the miracle of of uh, yeah, that's of your I, I call it your island, Mike. You know, if you're on a <laughs> desert island, you that's only get one desert island. Exactly, it's a desert island. If you're on an island, I guess I guess where Drew grew up would be considered a desert island, right, Drew? Uh, uh, I, I always found there was a funk. Yeah underneath Van Halen stuff oh, yeah. that I, from the moment they first came out, I really liked. Is, is, what is that? Is it Alice's drumming? Is it just, was it conscious or just the personality and identity of the band? I think it's just the way, I think it's the way that they grew up together, if you want to know the truth. I think, you know, they will both, I mean, from the things that I was able to, to gather from, from some of the conversations when I was there, they really grew up on, on Zeppelin, uh, uh, Clapton, mm -hmm. Cream, uh, believe it, Ed, Ed loves Leslie Weston Mountain. Um, oh, uh, Alex loved, you know, all the, all the great drummers of Mississippi all time. Mississippi Queen, um, um, I ripped off the cowbell from that song and used that sound in Lady Marmalade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Good yeah, for you. The same See, well, all the great things you've done, you can relate to that. It's amazing. Yeah. But he, but he really, they, they, I guess, in answer to your question, is that they, they uh, kind of took every great thing that they've ever heard and kind of assimilated that into their own. They never, I would say this more about them than anyone, they never copied anyone, mm -hmm. but they took all the great stuff and just gl that they gleaned into and, and incorporated it into their own sound. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll, you'll hear Alex, for instance, sometimes right nailing on the beat, and sometimes, just for a measure or two, you back it's off, there. and it's just, I mean, and with Ed doing that, you know, like in Panama, you know, and the, you know, the upstroke, I mean, it's, the, it's, their, it's their, their combined sense of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And harmony, it's just, it's just Cause, incredible. Because it seemed raw, but it was really nuanced. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like well, when I, as I hear you, as you, as I hear you talk about it, the power of it never was diminished, but the, but the intelligence of it the, was was in those little subtle movements. Good word, good word. It's the, the, the and, and the intelligence and the nuance of everything. They, they know exactly what they're doing. Don't, mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff happens, you know, when you just kind of get together and throw it together, but they know what they're doing. A lot of people forget about the first album, and, and one of the things, I, I know that was before your uh, yes. tenure there, but the first Absolutely. album is unique because it could essentially been recorded with one mic. There was so much mic bleed on every instrument, and you and I were talking about that, and that gave it a, a charm that, you know, every mic had as much of everything else in it as the, as the instrument it was miking. Mm -hmm. They pan the drums one side, vocals another side. One minute was that? What was it? Ted Templeman that did that record? It, it was. It, uh, Ted Templeman was a producer. It was Don Landy that I think did most of the engineering on, on that. Because that was done at Sunset uh, Sound. Uh, okay. You know that was mo the first two records. But were why did they get away from some of that? I you know. I mean, you're not the spokesman for the group, but I, I mean, you were know. privy to some. You know what happens, Dave? You get you get you get a little bit more sophisticated about what you're doing, and you go, well, I, I want these. I want to use more, uh, maybe up to date methods or things like that. But I think a lot of repeatability is an important thing too. What Templeman wanted to do, yes. Well, and what I think Tevin wanted to do really was he wanted to capture their live performance oh. mm -hmm. in the first and, and second record in particular. Well, he did. He did. And, and if you, because remember, I, I think, think that, you told me that's a live record without an audience. That's how I always, <laughs> I always thought about that. It was like, you know, why does this thing sound so live? I just don't hear any people clapping or laughing or, or screaming. You know, it's just, uh, and I say laughing too, because I, I mean to say that, that uh, there's a tremendous amount of sense of humor that comes through both. Ed and Al have these incredible, they're, they're the funniest people you've ever met. And their sense of humor and their personalities come out directly right through their instruments. I mean, it's, it's uncanny. I think in the engineering profession, I, I notice personality does have a way of influencing how you make a record and how you think about music and, and the end, end product is so per, personality-wise. I mean, I can almost, I, I, I kid, but I can almost tell you what an engineer is going to sound like just by looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've worked so closely, closely with so many artists, and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It, it's really, a, it's really about. Uh, I know you can relate to the fact that that it's you want to be there for them. You want, you want if you if they need a little steering, if they need a little help in in a, in a technical sense, you're there for that. But but uh, you like to let allow them 
to let their yeah. personalities come through, and that's yeah. really uh, that's, that's that's engineering 101. Is, I mean, it really is. You, you know, know what? Yes, do sir. you mind if we work in our CJ? Oh, no, please core do. Office? Absolutely. No, no, we're, no. we're just going to keep the conversation. Can I ask one more question. No, you, no we, I want you to continue. Oh, we're, okay. we're just going to get to Drew. And, the, and let me ask a question too, and then okay. you ask yours because okay. your inspiration coming out of New York. What was the dream? Yeah. Interesting. I don't know if I had one, but I, I always I always wanted to play guitar myself. You know that, yeah. and and so. The funny thing about this was that I, I found, I think, at an early age, I kind of realized that, that music and electronics were going to work very well in, uh, together. This was, I'm talking about, like, mid-60s. And, and I, I guess I kind of understood in some way, shape, or form that uh, even, even though it may have been very uh, immature, if you will, at, at, at that point, but I always had it, I, I knew I loved music. I mean, deep, deep within, within me. I just always loved it. I grew up on, uh, first it was big band in my house with my parents, and, and, and of course then the Beatles came around in, you know, early mm -hmm. 60s. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on that stuff. And then, of course, um, you know, later on it was, you know, Hendrix, Jeff Beck, Clapton. Axis Boulder's Love. Axis Boulder's Love. Was Please give me a break, you know. So, I mean, but, but those things, so, and, and I always had that, I always was so interested in music, and I also developed, when I was 15, I got, I got a job at this great electronic store on Long Island in New York. It was actually a part of a chain, and, and I worked there for six years, and I couldn't believe how much I learned, and I was able to, 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 uh, to correlate between the two. I could see that eventually you were going to need both. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you wanted to work... ahead of your time at that. Well, I, I think I was right along, maybe even with a lot of people. I, I felt like it was, I was on that, the crest of that wave for, for a while. That, that was yeah. very helpful. Let me ask you a question yes. that you can't answer. <laughs> um, There's probably many I can't answer, believe me. I'm not going to ask for a value judgment, but in your uh, ability to wear both hats, what was the difference in sound going from the API console to the SSL console, and how'd that affect everybody's creativity, and how'd that affect um, the process of them making a record, if at all? Well, that's that's a, actually a really good question. Um, that's what I do for a living. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, well, try. <laughs> that was an exaggeration. The uh, that's what <laughs> well, you know, you know, uh, you know how the API uh, it behaves. It's 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 mm -hmm. a kind of a gritty kind mm -hmm. of a uh, you know. Um, I always thought of it as the American Neve kind of a thing, if you will. Me too. Yeah, you know, but, uh, and, and what's interesting about this one was that this was fitted with um, uh, GML uh, moving faders. Oh, wow. Was yeah. it a 32 channel? Yeah, no, it was actually, a fi it was a 50, I think it was. Oh, uh -huh. no, 48 maybe, or 50, I forget. I think it was 50. Uh -huh. And w what had happened was I had actually, uh, shortly after I uh, began to work there and started to do some of the cleanup and fix up um, at the studio, um, I had started pull a few channels at a time when I was going to recap and rebuild and everything because there were uh, no, no two of them sounded the same. No two channels on the API sound the same, and 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 it was definitely a project that was going to take, you know, the better part of a year, if you will, to really make it, um, to really make it right. And then uh, the 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 suggestion had come up that should we, you know, should we really go to a newer did you go to an E or a G? It was no, it was a J. Oh, you went that new? Yeah, yeah, it was that new. It was actually, it was actually purchased brand new. And I have to tell you, the control room at fifty one fifty is not large, That's and not we big. had to shoehorn this thing in. Barely the door, the door closed mm. uh, when, when we were able to. But it was, it, that was actually one of my most challenging. Did uh, you think the record sounded better or just different? I think that. Uh, yeah, in answer to your original question, the the SSL is is cleaner, of course, and more repeatable channel to channel, of course. But I think that uh, you know, for 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 me, it's always about Ed as the source. So whatever his sound is, is always gonna it's always gonna be that. And if he needs to bring the console into the mix, so to speak. For that sound, fine. If he, if if the con, you know, an SSL is much more transparent, obviously, than an API. Sonically. Okay. What did so Eddie think, think about plugins? Did he ever mess with plugins? Um, not really. That was not his thing. Uh, most of his stuff was, uh, was basically, uh, uh, you know, actual uh, hardware. 
Okay. Let's, why don't we continue it and Let's bring in it. our man Drew. In the, in Drew! Hey, 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 hey. Drew, back from Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah. Had so much damn fun, he didn't hit us, Herb. Ask, <laughs> ask our guests some questions, Drew. <laughs> All right, hey, George. All right, uh, you mentioned earlier about your attitude in the studio from Soundright Pro. Uh, you say check your attitude, agreed. Do you introduce anything new when you mix with someone so great, or is it, I'll just do whatever you say? Is there a time when you say no? Okay, that's that's very that's interesting. Great question. It's a good great question. question. The um, uh, when I when I say check the ego at the door, it's uh, you. That's not necessarily saying that you have to check your attitude. I think you have to bring your personality to whatever you're going to do, and so in a sense, you do have to have your attitude there with you. Well, like Herb said, it's a trust factor that you. Develop so part of that trust is saying when things don't sound quite right. Exactly, but in and a you, respectful way. You, your experience, I'm sure, has been the same as mine. Same, it, yeah. To speak truth to power is a very um, interesting, uh, 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 you know, ability in our business. You have to be able to say when something isn't right, um, even though the artist may say, "Look, this is how I, I think it should be." Maybe there's a misunderstanding as to what. Uh, is taking place technically. So what you do is you, you don't shy away. I would say in answer to, to the question, you don't shy away from uh, what you feel is right because you have to be true to your art and to, and to yourself and to the science that you're trying to bring to the art. Because um, I really believe uh, it's, 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 it's quite a balance. That, you know, mm -hmm. I believe that there's, a, there's an art to every science and a science to every art. Yeah. That's really the thing. Herb, let me t I'll, I'll say this real quick. What I try to do is, I try to never say, that sucks, <laughs> unless I'm dealing with Drew. Uh, but I try to use varying degrees of positive. So if, if I really like something, I'm like, man, that's incredible, it's amazing, give me a copy, I want to hear that when I go home. And if I don't like something, I go, no, it's all right, it's cool. You yeah, know? That's right. It's not bad, not bad. Yeah. And so people that work with me over the course of a, a, a day or two, they understand which is which, and I don't have to be negative and kill an idea that's just blossoming and kill it prematurely sure. like you know. Right. Uh, another one from Dark Pine Studio. When mixing, who do you really work for? The producer, the artist, the label, or some combination? All the above. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at this point, I would say the, the label is really out of the picture. With, with a group like Van Halen, they are in control. Right. That is not always the case, as you know. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, especially nowadays, you have to be aware of what the label is and, and how, how the uh, what the label is concerned with and how they factor into it. But at this particular point, um, Van Halen had such uh, creative um, control over their own project that really, in a sense, um, the, the producer was, was Ed and, and Al. I mean, most, most of the time, that was, they were their own producers. So really, all you had to do was work with the artist to make sure that you were giving them what they, what they felt they needed. You know, they, there, there may be a, a the, the kinds of uh, instances that you'll come across where even from a technical standpoint you think you know what should happen but the artist hears something in his head that, he ha that you haven't heard yet yeah. and that's, that's something that you know you walk that fine line yeah. so you have to always allow for what you don't know yeah. You know, those moments are what you live for as an engineer to that, be around those. Exactly, because all of a sudden that's the magic that's going to happen that you could never, you know. You know, here's the thing. I think it's very important to know what you know and know when to throw the book away. Right, absolutely. Good, good way to put it. All right, one more uh, from T. Knox. How important is the role of saturation and distortion in a rock mix compared to modern day pop mix? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Can my, you repeat the question? My pay grade allows me to answer that. Uh, T. Knox, how important is the role of saturation and distortion in a rock mix compared to a modern try and day take a pop mix? Stab at it. Yeah. Well, uh, saturation is, is a broad term, so I'm assuming because we're talking about Van Halen that you're talking about tape saturation, and in a rock mix, tape saturation and uh, various ways to emulate it, whether it be the Waves MPX or the UAD Studer 800 or the AC by McDSP or any of uh, the Phoenix plugins by uh, Dave Hill. Those are attempts to basically give you what you would get. Oh, I see Dylan's face. Dylan can help us with this. He's a genius at saturation. Um, you're basically trying to emulate tape saturation. And with tape saturation, the way to think of it metaphorically is that that can be the glue that ties a lot of various elements together. 
So tape saturation is very important, and uh, now more than ever, like with heat and um, uh, Pro Tools and, the, and the, the various tape machine emulations, now more than ever we've got the ability to, um, I want to choose my verb carefully because we're not, we, we, don't, we don't duplicate tape saturation, uh, but we can approximate something that gives us a feeling of, of, of that going on, which is weird because I told you there'll be no questions about tape. <laughs> what am I sitting here do, doing a tape? I can see Dylan falling asleep over there. We're about, to, we're, about, we're about to go to Niagara Falls. Okay. Just from Toronto State Airport. Drew, you got one more that you can shoot to us before we go to Battle Yeah, yeah. Uh, From Poltergeist Polar. Um, with the male artists with strong vocals and inflection, especially in the high mid range, what mic and, or miking technique also would you prefer for durability and frequency range? What was David, uh, David Lee Ross go to? Do you remember? Uh, in the studio, uh, it was usually uh, a Neumann of some sort. I mean, stage is always going to be a 58. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's really, you have to remember, these guys came from live. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, in the studio, he liked a big diaphragm condenser mic? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of those, uh, uh, like even a C12, I think. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, There's something not right seeing David Lee Roth in front of a C12. I know, and I'm trying, you know, honestly, I'm trying to remember some other, some other, um, what was the, scenarios. What was the compressor that they liked? Um, there was always an LA-2A uh, oh. in the house, and um, there were some uh, Pultec EQs as well. But as far as compression, um, I just, all I really, uh, all we really had was, oh, there was, I think there was a tube tech at one point. But L CL-1B? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the you know, two-way, I mean, I, I hate to be mundane, but it's, it's the standard, you know. Yeah, it, it, no, was, it was no. quite, quite the, uh, uh, you know, the reference. We, this time flies, and it's, it's just too I quick. Know. But, you know, before you... <laughs> I'm think, lucky I get to ask George more questions after the show. <laughs> this is fantastic, and, and we'd love to have you back at some oh, point. Oh, I, 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 I would certainly appreciate yeah. can, that. Can I give you a personal thanks on, oh, a, yeah. on a completely oh, aesthetic man. level? Here, here's what it is. <laughs> We have two examples of rock and roll hair here. <laughs> Completely out of control. <laughs> and rock and roll quaffed and stuff. And to bring that I'm kind of classiness I'm to our show I'm was so neat. And so I'm I just so want to thank you on that level. No, 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 it's cool. See, I, I look at him and I want to be like that. <laughs> okay, okay, camera on me. When, when, uh, when Herb and I were coming up with this show, we had talked about that, that it could have a vibe like some cooking shows where you, you might not necessarily need to be a chef in order to enjoy the show. So in keeping with that, I thought I would adopt a Julia Childs modified hairdo hey, just to add to the... Okay, good. Yeah, it's been amazing. Let's go to George Banks. Hey, thank you so much. Pleasure. Could I give one more shout sure. out to, uh, to of a friend of mine, Matty Brook? I, he, he's been a mainstay at 5150 for years, Eddie's Guitar Tech, and helped me get involved. And I just wanted to Maddie. Uh, uh, honor that. Maddie, 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 Maddie. So, uh, we uh, love you. Big thanks. And, thank and, and, and Our pleasure. Thank you, man. Literally. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll do it uh, across the don't table. Don't go anywhere. Cool. Cool. All right, all right. So let's tee up Batter's Box, Will. Let's run that graphic. And Dave, you warm your arm up. And yeah, I'm ready. Introduce our guy. We have to change his name from 3D to HD because it's evolved. <laughs> 3D to but HD. The, this is one of the best though. The last time Dylan was on the show I think you had the worst introduction for any guest we've ever had. I'm surprised Dylan came back. Dylan can you hear me? Yeah you got me? Yeah I got you. Your lips aren't moving though. Um, Far away. Are my arms moving? No. Nothing's moving except that are you are you are you sitting in Vintage King's warehouse or is that your studio? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm at my studio, Pay Per View Studios, right now. Um, I'm, I'm in a bit of a transition stage right now, so there's gear stacked up all over the place. It looks great, Dylan. It looks really good. I, I like being in your studio. It's got such a great vibe. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Dave. It's uh, uh, and that's Pay Per View Studios with a V U, right? P A P E R V U. Yeah, like. V meter, meters, yeah, yeah, it's okay. a play on words. I just trying to figure out someone wants to get to your website. Uh, I heard that you, you, you know, talked. Are you still working on the um, on the uh, Hollywood Undead record and the Rio soundtrack? And did you finish Britney? Yeah, the, those are all out. I did a, I did one song on the Britney record called uh, Big Fat Bass, uh, which had Will I Am on it, and uh, you know, got a bunch of stuff and and in the works right now but um you know a lot of my clients don't like me mentioning it until the stuff's actually come out so i've got a lot of really cool stuff in the pipeline coming up oh cool so um you want to try this batter's box thing 
Yeah, let's do it. I mean, um, I told. Uh, are we doing? Are we doing like hardware? Are we doing software? Are we doing both? Are we doing? Let's do both, Dylan. You're you're so fast. I, uh, when you and I talked about it earlier, I was like, well, let me give you kind of a little heads up of what I'm talking about. And I love you because you said, no, nah, Dave, don't. I don't want to know what you're going to say. Just I want to do this right off the top of my head. So. Um, I mean, I'll preference it by saying, you know, when I'm using hardware, it is kind of important that I use certain converters I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the Lynx Aurora converters. They've got a new one called the Hilo, which is incredible, and it has all these cool skill sets in it. So outside of that, just, just throw them at me, and I'll, I'll spit out whatever okay. pieces of gear I use for things for mixing. Okay. Um, so so you, you want to give me – how you want to do it, Dale? You want to do um, compressors and EQs, plug-ins, and analog? Sure. Or you just want why, to do why don't we do why don't we do like compressors, hardware, software, and then EQs, hardware, software? Okay. Uh, I'm just here for the, you know, to make the show look cute. So <laughs> whatever you hear, whatever you want to do, lead All vocal. Right, okay. Ooh, uh, for compressor, the Crane Song STC8 or a uh, TubeTech CL1B. For the software, the CL1B version of it. For EQ, the new A Designs uh, JMC uh, 3001, and then for EQ uh, software, I'd say probably the Massenburg EQ or the Filter Bank E6 EQ. Great! Quick shout out to uh, to our buddy Peter Montesi at A Designs. Um, background vocals. Uh, for hardware compressor, A Designs Nail or uh, sometimes a Neve 33609. Yeah, for right. software versions of that, the UA33609 or the UA Fairchild. For hardware EQ, I'd say the A Designs Hammer. Um, and then for the software version of that, the Massenburg EQ and the Filter Bank E6. The, the A Designs nail into the hammer uh, combination is just magical on background vocals. I'm a real big fan. Are you following this, Drew? He's moving pretty fast. I'm listening. Okay, what do you, 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 you say on lead vocal? 33609. That was background vocals, Julie. <laughs> All right. Where's Zan when you need him? Zan, give us a call, please. Drew, he's still in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> Acoustic guitar. Uh, TubeTech CL1B or the TubeTech CL1B software version. Um, the, uh, I'll keep going. The uh, GML8200 for EQ uh, or the... Uh, uh, Mog Audio EQ4 that's just come out. It's like the NTI EQ, oh, basically. Yeah. Cliff, our buddy. Uh, the software version, I'd say the Massenburg EQ or the Filter Bank E6. My, my, my biggest issue with the TubeTech software version is it acts like it's detended, so you have to double-click the knob and enter in the amount if you want to get in. It's like there's like a seven-click range between zero and like 10 dB on the gain. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's it's a little bit frustrating, but that, that's what I use in the software room. Kick drums. Let's do uh, let's do um, um, program kick drums samples. Um, you know, I I pretty much keep them the same. I'd say the the DBX uh, 160 XT, the version that I have, is audio upgraded by Jim Williams. I'm a big fan of it. Um, the software, I'd probably use the UA, the, the Universal Audio version of the SSL 4000 um, for, for compression. You know, and I know there's other stuff in there, but, um, and then for the, the uh, EQs, I'd say the A-Designs, a the 500 Series EM uh, PEQ, which is kind of like a solid state Pultec. That's the um, little 500 Series. Yeah, it's, it, it's the little, the little guy. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it's got a different, there's a more solid sound than, than using a, you know, actual pull tech to me. Mm. Um, and then the, the kick, the version, like the software version, I'd say would be the U, U, universal audio pull tech is usually what I use. Okay. Is your, uh, is your snare chain significantly different? You want to kick, skip the snare or you want to do snare? Um, well, no, I, I th the main thing that I think is different is the amount of, of processing that I end up doing between them because whenever it's a, a, a pre-recorded kick drum, like if it's a kick sample, there's honestly quite a bit of production that's already been put into a lot of those and it takes a lot of self-control to keep yourself from overdoing it and, and just putting an EQ on something because it needs it. You have to listen for what's missing to make that happen. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, the other part of it is I end up, 
you know, with the live stuff, I like using the UA Studer stuff for a little bit of oversaturation. I usually use heat and, and, and Pro Tools with an entire mix, but I usually bypass it on that channel and use the Universal Audio Studer for an extra bit of saturation and warmth and things like that. Okay. Um, um, stereo bus. Ooh. Uh, the Crane Song STC-8 is probably my main go-to for that. Um, software compression, that's, that's a bit of a trickier question. It really, really, really depends on what program material I'm starting with. Um, I, I usually just avoid it altogether unless I'm doing some type of limiting to make things louder, in which case I'll probably use like either the Massey limiter or L316 because I can, um, I can, I can, you know, limit without having to worry about my snare drum disappearing within my mix. I, can, I have more control over it, but I'm not, I don't really get aggressive with software compression yeah. on my two mix these days. I like the 316. Uh, thanks for teaching me how to use it. You, you spend a lot of time showing it's, me how to use it. It's that pretty plugin. good. It's pretty good. For the EQ on my two mix, I really, really dig the, the NTI sound. Um, I have a rack of NTIs um, that, that I use. I, I could probably get around, get a, get away with using the the newer uh, Mog Audio one, mm -hmm. which is great. And the main thing I use it for is the air band, but um, it's it's uh, I, I like the older versions because I have more control over the fine versus the coarse knob, and and so far that's what I've been you know using the most. Uh, e EQ wise, uh, back to the Massenberg EQ or the Filter Bank E6 is incredible. The the you know, taking the slopes on the E6 is just great for certain program material. I really, really like the way that does that. It's, it's, I, I, there's analog EQs that can't do what that thing does for yeah, me. Yeah, I agree. Um, live bass. Uh, the Buzz Audio, um, the Opto compressor, which is the Essence um, for hardware compression. The UA DBX160 compressor is probably what I use on bass or an LA-2A. It kind of depends on, on how, you know, if it's a funky slap bass, you're going to need more compression to, to control the peaking. So in those cases, I might use like some kind of a 1176 or something like that. Um, for EQ, just the Pultec, a regular real Pultec. Um, and then for the software version of that, the UA Pultec. I should also preference this that I always use... The Crane Song Phoenix plugin set to Dark Essence on every bass that I've mixed yeah, since I've bass. got I, mean, I glue it plugin. to there. It is it is part of my bass sound. You and I, uh, you and I both lament uh, the times when we have to go to a native rig, which we both love, by the way, uh, uh, because we can't get that one plugin. It, that's it's so important that the that, it is that it's truly important. Um, I'm, Go ahead, yeah, I mean, heat, heat, heat is helpful, too, but I like, even whenever I have heat engaged, I tend to bypass it on my bass, and I use the Crane Song Phoenix, which, which I can adjust the amount of saturation because it's so important to the pocket that I'm getting within a mix. Okay, I got two more for you, Dylan. Um, pretend like you're, like you're George Sayer and tell me what you would do to get an Eddie Van Halen guitar sound if, if it was given to you by George. Man, you know, it's interesting because listening to this stuff, you have to put in context that 5150 was such a risky record to make because there was a personnel change going on and there were so many fans of Van Halen back then. You know, it's pretty amazing whenever you go back and listen to it. Um, listening to what George said, I mean, I'd probably try to go with something simple, but typically whenever I'm recording a guitarist like that that's going to do a one-take I like setting up three microphones. I set up an SM57 right where the dome meets the speaker on the front of the amp, and then one in the back. I flip the phase on it, and I move it around until it sounds completely thin, as, as thin as possible. An open back I, cabinet, though, right? Yeah, open, only on an open back cabinet. Yeah, this doesn't really work. Yeah, closed back with a mic on yeah, the back. Duh. Yeah, and, and, and whenever you flip the phase back, then in theory, they're both perfectly in phase. And when that happens, you lose a little bit of detail, but you get an extra bit of tonality. And if you don't want that, you just mute that, uh, that other channel. Those two channels, I sum together, and then I usually put a ribbon mic back further, something like, um, like I really like the Royers, the AAEs are both really great for, you know, more of the low-end stuff. And those I'm getting off access usually a little bit, and they're back further. And then between the summed SM57s and the, the ribbon mic, 
I use a, a Little Labs IBP between the two to lock oh. the phase to get the most tone out of them that I possibly can. Throw, throw, throw your heater pitch because we got to go. Throw the one. Oh, I get right one more. There. One more. Yeah. Quick. We got to be quick though. Your favorite, right. your favorite piece of gear for under two hundred dollars that you use on every Black Eyed Peas mix. Uh, how much is Crane Song Phoenix? Um, uh, I'd have to say Pro Tools because of the vocal editing and everything that we do. But I, I mean, I, I don't know how much you, you factor that into cost. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say the, the Massey limiter. Oh, okay. The 2007. Yes, the 2007. Yeah. Dylan, thank you so much, man. Thanks, Dylan. Good to see you, Anytime. Man. You hit about 20 out of the park. There. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Love your place, man. Love the little RCA dog. That's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the room looks good. The room looks real good, my friend. Cool batter's box. Thanks, Vintage King, for having it and for rolling. Yeah, I might add, Dylan, Dylan's uh, Black Eyed Peas mix was like 28 weeks at number one, and the new wow. record's doing incredibly well. He did all of that. Not so bad. Yeah. This one's come to a close, quickly. Interesting show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I don't know whether to go home and, uh, and pull out a CL1B and a, and a, and a a Phoenix Dark Essence, or to pull out my guitar and my Marshall amp and start playing again. Well, as you're thinking about it, and you can call George for advice, Will, do we have some winners of this Vintage King t-shirt? You know what, we'll figure it out. Let's just make sure we show them. Here it is. We're going to pick some winners. We're going to get them sent out to you, and you know, we'll, we'll post it up on our page who those winners are. We'll get it to you. We'll add some information. That's going to be a tough call. We have some good questions. Yeah, some good questions. And, and that's why we want you in the chat room. Drew did that. a good job, too. Absolutely. That's why Drew's our CJ. George, thanks again. Herb, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Dave, thank oh, you again. Man. My pleasure. Well, my pleasure. Yeah, it's inspiring. So uh, I hope everybody rewinds the part where you were talking about how an engineer should approach their, their job and their craft and uh, the role that a great engineer plays in the process of uh, someone like Eddie's creativity. I hope people really pay attention to that because that's the essence of, of what this show's about. Appreciate that. That's, that's deep, deep, deep inside it's info, right? It's definitely a humbling Absolutely. experience, that's for sure. I'm, sh I'm shocked at, at how your philosophy about handling Eddie was so similar to Herb's philosophy about managing a major artist. It was, it was, it was, I just it, think it's something you learn. Yeah, it, yeah, it really is. Uh, if you don't learn it, you won't <laughs> get to. Yeah. But ultimately. Did, well, did that surprise you a little bit? Um, well, what I, you know, and Say not yes, to, Herb. No, I don't want to belabor the point. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't surprise me. Because, <laughs> oh, man. Well, here's why. Because when you get into it's just like who was the guest we had um, who said that I think it was Alex when we showed the Alex interview when you work with greats sometimes it's the easiest things you work with because they're sort of their parameters mm -hmm. and when you learn those parameters you learn to abide by them and it's similar yeah. you know I, I always tell people all the time if you want to be successful emulate successful people absolutely <laughs> That's absolutely, right. absolutely. Not, not that complicated. very well put we gotta go home okay so bye bye thank you alright guys uh, Man, it's been a lot of fun, as always, hanging out with you, and appreciate the comments on Facebook and uh, get to us like you usually do. Yeah, all those other places, and thanks again for making us real cool on YouTube. And uh, we'll you we've got time. some great stuff coming up for you next week. Bye bye. See you. Thank you.